So we start with chapter one today, the human aspiration. The life divine is a journey which starts with human aspiration, and it ends with the divine life. The birth of aspiration in man is a sign that he is already marked out in the grand scheme of things to arrive at what he aspires for. It is the greatest gift, actually. Even if nothing is there, it is said that you know, if we have these two things, faith and aspiration. Of course, the mother also uses the term courage, faith and courage. One can rebuild from the smash. So the two most precious things to be preserved, guarded, like the most sacred treasures are faith and aspiration. Faith comes first, it is like the glow that there is a fire, <laughs> there is some source of light, it's the light. And then it takes the form of aspiration and it is said and the mother speaks about it that when aspiration is born, it generally means that maybe one life or a couple of lives one is going to arrive. It comes, it, it is there in the human being but it is hidden for a long time. There is a very interesting story in both Greek and uh, Indian uh, legends about uh, this fire. In the Greek story we know that the Greek god who got this fire to man is Prometheus. So he got the fire to give it to man. Fire was in heaven. So gods didn't want to give it to man. Why? Because they know if man has it, he will grow greater than the gods. So they deprived him, but one day, out of feeling of uh, kindness, uh, he takes the fire, steals it from heaven and gives it to earth, to men. And so she who punishes him and punishes him and says, this is not fair, but deed is done. So they punish him in a very strange way that uh, at night, all his entrails will be eaten up. And in the morning, they will come up again. Much like human life, because this fire is there, it, you know, he is a god, after all, he is an immortal, they can't kill him. But this is the punishment they give it to him. Our Indian story is a far more sweeter story, where fire is mentioned symbolically, where Sri Krishna, while returning after Narkasur Sanghar, and uh, as he is coming, Satya Bhama sees uh, the tree of aspiration, Parijat, blooming in Indra's garden and she says, I want it. So Sri Krishna says, fine, there we go and then Indra says, no, 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 again. Why? Because he knows the moment human beings have this tree, they will be equal and greater than the gods. But, well, Sri Krishna is the victor, both of them fight, bring the tree, and they plant it upon earth. There is a nice line in Savitri referring to that, a branch of heaven transplant to human soil, which is what makes us overleap our mortal step. So, when they plant it, the story doesn't end here. It is a very sweet um, after effect of it. So, Rukmani says, I too want it. <laughs> so... <laughs> There is a dilemma because Satya Bhama has fought for it. It was her request and Sri Krishna has got it. But Rukmani also wants it. So only Krishna can solve this in his own way. <laughs> he plants it with Satya Bhama's garden. He says, see, she is the one who has to get it. But he says, when the tree grows, I will ensure that the branches turn towards Rukmani's house. So, while she will see the flowers blooming, they will fall in Rukmani's courtyard. I have seen that Parita tree mother is named as aspiration. It is like flames turning upward and at night it fills Arshingar and so beautiful, uh, the, like a flame. So, this story is so beautiful and symbolic. This is not something to be tried in practical world plant in somebody's house and... <laughs> What it means is, Satya Bhama is Bhuputri. She is Bhumija. She is born of earth. 
So this has to be planted upon earth. And Rukmani is none other than Goddess Lakshmi, the consort of Vishnu. So it will be planted on earth, but it will flower, it will carry, carry us right up to the fullness at the feet of the Divine Mother in her lotus home. This is, this is the power of this fire. And the beauty of this fire is that once lit, it can never die. It can be covered. And even when we look at the physical fire, the symbol is so obvious. This fire grows by feeding it. Where does it grow? It burns upward. So people often ask the difference between aspiration and desire. Desire spreads like this. Desire wants more, but horizontally. Aspiration also wants more, but that more is not within the frame of whatever it has. So when it reaches the next level, like the horizons, it still wants more. That's what we read yesterday about Usha. The dawns that succeed one upon other. That's how this fire grows and all of us know about it. How the journey starts in a very uh, beautiful way with a little bit of aspiration. And as it grows, the aspiration also grows. Till one day, the final aspiration is to become one in all our entirety with the Divine. That's how this aspiration continues. And this cannot be done artificially. So this fire grows vertically, water can douse it, winds when it is very small may finish it, but when the fire grows, the winds is the what it feeds with. So there is a whole conversation in one of the Upanishads, which God is greater, Vayu or Agni? <laughs> so without Vayu, there is no Agni, you know, it, is, it draws from the Vayu, from the same vital energy, Vayu, it draws that energy and turns it upward. And then it blooms into space. So the wider the mind, the more this fire grows. If the mind is very small, it feels stifled. So all this is so beautifully, all our earth is a reproduction of some deep profound truth. So we start with this fire and here Sri is speaking about this, this fire, the human aspiration. We know Rig Veda is full of um, hymns to the fire mystic fire and um, here Shobindo is speaking about the collective aspiration, the Vishu Yagna in Greek uh, mythology the god of fire is Hephaestus, he is like our Vishu Karma and he builds the worlds. So because of fire it is said in our Veda, fire has built the worlds. So one wonders how it has built the world. Leaving aside its occult dimension, because normally the fire destroys, it consumes everything. How does it build the worlds? It is called Jatvedas, the knower of all births. Anything which is created upon earth starts with this urge. Eastrus, heat. And then this urge lights up, as they say, no? Flame, like it. It ignites something inside us. And then the creation begins. It is the beginning of all things. That's why this fire, there is an occult dimension to it also, but very simply, it fills in us the urge for progress. So that's what the mother speaks of also in, you know, in context of Auroville, she spoke about unending progress. So if there is um, the urge to know more, to grow more, to progress more in every which way, it means this fire is burning well. It may take different forms. And so, this is a grand opening of the Life Divine. The earliest preoccupation of man in his awakened thoughts and as it seems, he is given the right commas, where to stop, we can't read like this. The earliest preoccupation of man in his awakened thoughts and as it seems, it won't make sense. <laughs> I mean, it will make sense, but we have to. So, he is himself is doing this work for us, where to break, where to pause. The earliest preoccupation of man in his awakened thoughts. So he is telling us that what has man been preoccupied with since beginning. And as it seems, his inevitable and ultimate preoccupation. We have our friends all around, I mean not here, neighbours up the Indian borders and neighbours here and there who will tell us, Man's first needs and the last are roti, kapada or makan. 
So, believing that, people went to America and had roti, kapda and makan. They are still unhappy. This is not what we really, this is needed for the body. But man has something insatiable inside him. That's what he is going to point us. It is the first and the ultimate preoccupation. Why is Shobindu calling it as ultimate? For it survives the longest periods of skepticism and returns after every banishment. We have just, we are in fact emerging out of this age of skepticism. If we really look, um, skepticism, cynicism, all this was so rampant, even the art took that form. Because of this great uh, sense that, you know, uh, after the two wars, which broke a lot of old values, people didn't believe, there was no hope apparently. And look within few decades, today, okay, <laughs> hold the breath, if we have to. <laughs> earn good money, one of the ways is become a <laughs> Swamiji. People are thirsty. I mean, nothing, nothing wrong with being a Swamiji, true Swamiji. Look at Vivekananda. He goes all the way to light up this fire in America and he really stays hungry. People are not there even to give him food. He would knock at a door and people, oh, this, what kind of a dress this is? Are you educated? They would laugh at him. There are such wonderful stories about Swamiji that once he went, he was having food in some restaurant, there was an English man sitting there and he tells him, Sir, when Swamiji brought his plate and brought it there, he's, this man remarked, pigs and swans don't eat together. Swamiji got up and said, okay, I'll fly away. <laughs> Okay, I fly away. And that's… What a brilliance! But till the last, people were not letting him even speak at the Chicago center. Oh, what will he speak? What faith he represents, etc., etc. But when he spoke, he roared and the world listened and a fire was lit in America. Look at, you know, its repercussions today. So, this is the fire. It returns after every period of skepticism. Skepticism cannot ever ultimately satisfy us or fulfill us. So, that's why, you know, when people, I think some of us may be conversant reading John, Paul, Sotre and, you know, after reading it, you see, kya kitab hai? <laughs> It takes away, snatches whatever hope you may have. That kind of existentialism. But if you look at the um, early part of the previous century, it was, it was raining upon people believed that such is the thing. So, skepticism and after every banishment, God was banished. 1900, God was banished, decided by a committee of scientists. We can explain everything based on just give us show us how a hydrogen atom is created and all the rest can be explained. We don't need God. And God entered through so many doors, they were so convinced they have found the ultimate answer and that same year, two discoveries in the field of science, Einstein and Max Planck, they broke that entire model, it was shattered. And till today they are reeling under its effect and not knowing where is the foothold. Atoms. Protons, neutrons, electron, boson, now something new. Now they are, they don't know where to, they thought that they have found this solid world. This is the power of this God is present inside. He, he bursts himself from every direction. It returns after every banishment. This many of us must have witnessed. At least um, uh, we have, some of us have gone through that age. Not those who lived here very fortunate, but. <laughs> living outside when it was almost declared God, if you believe in God, you were outdated. Now to have a guru is like, you are, you, okay, you have a personal psychiatrist and you have a guru. So it's like cool thing nowadays. <laughs> so um, it returns after every banishment is also the highest which is thought can envisage. So Sri speaks of thought as the bird paraclete. So what does it, what does a bird do? It makes its home in the nest is in the branches of a tree. Then it flies. 
See, just like flowers are the soul in vegetal kingdom, birds are the soul of the animal kingdom. And they will fly up and they will go and they will come back and they come. So they reconnoiter. So thoughts. Thoughts have this tendency to go, to seek. So it is the highest formula that is thought can envisage. Earliest, from the beginning. Caveman is preoccupied with this because he was bit by an incurable bug. Who am I? No creature questions. But man begins to question, who am I? Why am I? So, with that he starts. And how does this manifest, this preoccupation? It manifests itself in the divination of Godhead. What a word should be this. Something within us knows. It's not logically, we may not be able to logically argue it. Later on, yes, experience justifies. Divination of Godhead. There is something which which is like a Godhead towards which we must rise, which we must become. It's inbuilt within us. It's divined. Divined is intuitively like you divine water. It is here. And see, we do it so intuitively. So every time we say namaste to each other, we, we say it ashram, this is very good. We point out here. Good morning, bonjour. We don't say bonjour. I mean, how much ever we may say head is superior, but when it comes to me, I am here. Nor do we pat on the stomach and say, I am fine. I am fine. See, this, this, how, how does automatically, and there is something very sacred. One can sense it even without anything. There is something very sacred. Heart. You don't just touch it just like that. There is something very beautiful about this. So, divination of Godhead, the impulse towards perfection. How does it express in so many ways? That's why in Auroville, the mother spoke of, uh, and Russians didn't want the word divine. So they say, okay. Are they okay with perfection? Yes. Okay. They can use the word perfection. Now perfection is again very interesting. Perfection is not an end point. You see, you try to make your little room perfect. You have done, put certain things. Now after that, you want something else. And when you bring that, everything has to adjust. And then something else. It is an unending process. And I am giving just a material example. So with human nature. Perfection is not an end point. Perfection is an ever-growing, higher and higher equilibrium. That is the beauty of perfection. So perfection. The impulse towards perfection. The search after pure truth. And unmixed bliss. All our journals are a proof, scientific journals, that we are searching for pure truth. Where, it, where we are not searching for pure money, there it's like science is searching for pure truth. That's why one day somebody says, this vaccine is very good. Then after some time, say, no, this had so many side effects, so many people die and there are debates and discussions. And this one recent example, so many examples... Because it wants that truth which cannot be, which ultimately we can say is pure. One sign of that pure truth is, it's without shadows. That's how the mother describes. I don't know how far it is true, but tomorrow is supposed to be one of the days when such an alignment takes place, when there are no shadows. I'm waiting to see. It's a WhatsApp University Gyan. I don't know. <laughs> there will be no shadow. But okay. But ultimately to reach that point where there are no shadows, no possibility of error. In science, all research carries within itself the possibility of error. That's how they say the bell curve. This much will escape from the norm. And what is that norm? It's nothing but average. It's not truth. So one is still looking. And then unmixed bliss, the cause of all unhappiness. So with... Human nature has this strange tendency. When there is nothing, you want just a little. If God comes, what do you want, my child? Thoda hai, thode ki jarurat hai. Just, he gives you. You are blessed. But now what happens? You are waiting for the God to come. He says, now what is it? I have a little, just a little more will do. Then he gives a little more, fills those spots with little more. Again, he says, actually, you know, I have little more, thank you so much, but can you make it a bit much more? 
and then much more it doesn't end <laughs> because <laughs> we are looking for that happiness that never can fade away whatever gives us happiness momentarily fades after some time that's why if we read uh, wuve the text that mother recommended it says so beautifully you know that the only way is when you don't have these desires because they will they take a long route ultimately they also take us at some point it fails you realize the other is you go with that which is leading you and carrying you you will lose certain things on the way you just can't help it but go the river flows towards the sea where it can get satisfaction a river is never satisfied with the banks imagine the river says this is such a lovely bank and now you know it has turned into a lovely ghat can i just wait here the force that is impelling it will say sir madam river feminine your goal is the sea short of it you can never be satisfied and happy flow towards the sea see it's such a beautiful lesson so unmixed bliss the so next time when we are unhappy don't blame it on anybody blame it on god if you wish to but basically it's because he wants to give us the ultimate so it goes through these steps it has to go through these steps mother says that these illusions are necessary part of the so that we become more and more prepared to receive unmixed bliss the sense of a secret immortality and this where kimasharyam the story is interpreted one way is that yudhishthir was simply saying it is such a surprise that every day we see people die and yet we believe that we are immortal now this story like many of these cryptic stories can be interpreted in a very dark pessimistic way see everybody dies why do you believe you are immortal now this is one way to interpret the story but we have in our culture when a person dies we don't say yamraj yamraj satya we say ram naam satya still <laughs> so <laughs> so this sense of secret immortality is what you uh, he is pointing out you this there that though we see everybody dies yet we somewhere believe we are immortal that's why till date even somebody when he dies at 90 oh bechara mar gaya we know <laughs> that people die and one can understand a young age but even in old age oh you somehow believe that there is within us the sense of a secret immortality and that's why we want to extend ourselves in our children in works of art in creativity somewhere or the other through name this that we want to extend that sense of secret immortality this is how it manifests so it's not necessary that it will you know when somebody is marked out he'll say oh i want god or divine it need not it may, one one may simply say i want to progress endlessly it's the same thing spoken in a different way somebody may say i want perfection of course perfection is not just physical psychological perfection mother speaks of perfection is at many levels spiritual perfection spiritual perfection is where all aspects of the divine are fused into a single unity supramental perfection where the one and the many are brought together in a harmonious i can only use the expression wonder dance of delight that is supramental perfection so one doesn't perfection is something which keeps growing then pure truth where we can say once for all yes this is it and unmixed bliss where we can say payo param vishram ram saman prabhu nahi kahu i found the supreme blessedness and rest as uh, the upanishad puts it who finds that tamatmastham yenu pashyanti dhira stesham sukham sashwati netresham he finds that joy which is pure unmixed who who has glimpsed the one self otherwise this journey is not going to stop and it's good that it doesn't stop and the sense of a secret immortality the ancient dawns of human knowledge have left us their witness to the constant to this constant aspiration rigveda such a wonderful document of 
the aspiration, it's something amazing. If I leave aside the semantics, the slokas and all that, just to read them, um, even little bit, Shiva Bindu's translations are there, just to read that, it fills you with this sense of seeking ever higher and wider, the truer, the more beautiful. So this is the fire, ancient aspiration has left us a witness. Today we see, what do we see? Shubindu can only describe like this, a humanity satiated but not satisfied by victorious analysis of the externalities of nature. Sometimes you feel Shubindu is not speaking there, he is speaking today. <laughs> I mean, and so many, even his political writings, it looks like he is reporting the events of today. And in one of his poems he says, a hundred years, in his poem, A Vision of Science, a hundred years was before my eyes. So, surely in uh, 1914, or even when he corrected, we could not really say victorious artificiality of nature. Today we can say yes, more or less, because he is using a word, satiated, but not satisfied by victorious analysis of the externalities of nature, preparing to return to its primeval longings. The earliest formula of wisdom promises to be its last. God, light, freedom, immortality. And it takes many forms. God, aspects of God, this, that, doesn't matter. The ultimate, the highest God. But of course, sometimes we say, because we can't find the highest, because we don't have the enough aspiration, so we say, my God is highest, finished. <laughs> Now that is of course, but mankind cannot rest for long in that halfway home. By its nature, it will be pushed. Light, that intelligence, that luminous, that thought beyond thought, that clarity which shows us things just as they are, that is light, action of light. Freedom, Mother puts it so beautifully, the only freedom is freedom with the Lord. All other freedoms will discover it's bound, we are bound to discover that it is conditional freedom. And God, light, freedom, immortality. Even physical science is now um, almost there. Don't know whether it's really good or not. Imagine, you know, it, North Korea's dictator becoming immortal <laughs> with all this. <laughs> so it is only a sign that we must rush forward in the spiritual evolution. That's what it indicates. So we'll not be reading every passage because that will make it years and years and years, but we'll take up some keys. So first key is this earliest occupation of man, this aspiration which is the biggest gift of the divine to us and this never dies and I have seen, I'm sure everybody has seen in their life, there may be periods of doubt there may be periods of even apparent denial, where is God? But then it returns back. In fact, therein there is also the remedy, every time there is an obstacle. Mother gives such a wonderful remedy. Supposing there is an obstacle in outer life, inner life, whatever it is there. Instead of complaining, cursing, blaming, which are the easy way and make things worse, or paralyzing oneself, she says, intensify your aspiration. There is no obstacle which cannot dissolve. Intense. And actually that's their purpose. When we see that when we are stifled from every side, suddenly, Lord, that's how the earth and that is what is to be done and eventually nothing stands in its way. So this is the first sutra that Sri gives us and then people want to know what is the definition of divine life. Of course, the simplest is a life lived by the divine consciousness is the divine life. Life lived with the human consciousness is human life. Life lived with the animal consciousness is the animal life. Regardless of whether we have horns or we don't have horns. It doesn't matter. We may have a tail or not have a tail. This is not important. Hanuman with a tail is yet leading a divine life. I mean, to the extent that one can. And we without the tails are still... We like to put on nowadays those horns. <laughs> Nothing I go back to. <laughs> so... Divine life is a life lived with the divine consciousness. If the consciousness becomes divine, there is divine life automatically. 
that's why Shri Krishna tells Arjun in the Gita, whatever way a yogi lives or acts, he lives in me. You cannot judge by anything external because his consciousness is one with me. Therefore, of course, this is not a sanction because inside one knows and the divine knows. But that is the criteria. The criteria is inside, it is not outside. That's why it is said and wisely so, never imitate the actions of a wise person. <laughs> because the basis, Sri also says that, the basis of his action is very different. And if one doesn't get an access to that basis, one will be completely misled. See what happened to Dionysians in, in the Greek mythology. They are all seekers of Ananda and what happened ultimately to them? So one has to rise to that consciousness rather than imitate the outer action. Like people feel sometimes if I shut myself in a room and wear dhoti and don't go out, maybe I'll grow into the likeness of Sri First of all, let there be only one Sri <laughs> But the way to grow in likeness is to love Sri to serve Sri and not to shut ourselves unless, of course, inwardly somebody is impelled. That's a different story. But that's why equally we can't imagine if we play tennis and we do all the things that mother did whole day, we'll suddenly grow into… Uh, it. One has to love and serve. These are the only two beautiful ways and seek and aspire. So what is the divine life? Here we have the definition to know possess and be the divine being in an animal and egoistic consciousness. Right now, that's what we are. So when the animal stifles the human and doesn't allow the divine to emerge, then it's an animal which is overpowered. When animal is overpowered by the divine, the divine rides on the animal. All our See, this, uh, what is the great god, Dattatre and Ayyappa Swami. Wonderful, no? He rides on tiger. Tiger is passions. Very difficult to tame a tiger. He has chosen a very strange vehicle. To tame a tiger, you are capable of destroying the worst asuras. He rides on the tiger. So, when we ride over the animal, when the egoistic consciousness is replaced and in its place the mother is at the center, that's what the mother symbol means, to be recreated inside the divine at the center, then that is the first thing that is required to live the divine life. Then second is to convert our twilight or obscure physical mentality into the plenary supramental illumination. What is the physical mentality which goes by the data of the senses? Physical mind. Oh, this happened, therefore. Rather we should say, oh, that is the truth, therefore. We reverse the order. When we see a great destruction, we say, what is God doing? But if we took the other data, then we will say, oh, he wants a new creation, therefore he is destroying. See how Sri describes in Savitri, a giant dance of Shiva toward the past. Then he describes the new age children who are going to come down. So this whole viewpoint changes, plenary supramental illumination. Supermind is that which immediately that light connects us to what has gone past, what is going to come and in that totality we see the present and all its relations with each other. We will come to that when we touch upon the supramental. But instead of this twilight, hey, nahi hai. morning may God is there. Why? Because you have to pray to Him. Please give me my daily bread. Strange kind of anyways. When, if the bread comes, very good. If it's stale, He didn't listen to my prayer. And if it is not given, and how people have lived, you know, again, Swami Vivekananda's story, I so touched how these people have uh, shown the way. I mean, he is a true sannyasi. The only one on whom I feel ochre robe really kept it shan. So he is going in a train and um, uh, he had made a vow that I will not ask anything from anyone. If I need something, it will come. And then he will eat whatever is given to him. So that day, nothing comes. And there is a uh, man sitting by the side. He sees the Swami. He says, you take this and he, he says, no. 
at that point of time. And he curses what kind of a, you know, you people are parasite, this, that we hear, no? So, see, you should earn and you should earn with your whole hands and then you should eat. This is a saying also, like that, people believe. Swamiji doesn't say anything. So those days trains used to stop for long time, two hours, three hours, engine will come, all kinds of things. So there was a stoppage, so he got down from the train, he was sitting under the tree. And this man almost mocking at him, see, this is the kind of life you are leading. And suddenly a man comes with all puri, sabji, everything. <laughs> he says, what happened? He says, uh, sir, Ramji has sent this for you. This is a true story. People say Rama existed or not. Real documented story. So, he says, but, uh, I mean, I, it's okay, but if you don't, you don't feel compelled to give. No, no, sir. I, he is a alwai. So, he was sleeping night. He said, Ramji came in my dream. And he told me, my devotee is lying there. He is hungry for three days. Please go and prepare food and give it to him. He said, I thought I had dream <laughs> slept off. <laughs> then he says, Hanuman came. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> Hanuman's ways are not gentle like Rama. Rama is very gentle, please feed him. Then <laughs> when Hanuman comes, like mother said, no, when somebody spoke uh, not very kind words about mother, his knee was swollen and he said, Mother, did you get angry? He said, my child, I don't get angry. But you know, the gods are there. I can't stop them from their action. So when Hanuman came, he woke him up forcefully. He says, Rama, Ramji wants you to do this. So he is two o'clock. He gets up, poor fellow, <laughs> makes it. He described, he takes the whole food to Vivekananda and says, Sir, please take it. This is my request to you. Then the man who is there, he realizes... That, you know, if we really live depending upon the Divine alone, He takes care. It's difficult. It's a leap of faith. But that's what aspiration can do to man. It's not Roti Kapda Makan is a different teaching. That, you know, if you are poor, all this actualization, Maslow's hierarchy, our Kabir realizes the Divine. He is not born in a very big family. All that he asks for is that, you know, give me this much that I don't go hungry and I feed the others if somebody comes a guest in my house. Swami Vivekananda doesn't even ask for that. And he's provided, taken care of. So, in that, instead of the physical consciousness, there is that illumination. To build peace and a self-existent bliss where there is only a stress of transitory satisfactions besieged by physical pain and emotional suffering. Instant gratification gives us no doubt. Immediately we feel happy. But we know with this one happiness comes two pleasures, sometimes five of them free of cost, pain. If one comes you can handle, but two, three, four, five. And then you don't know. <laughs> the pleasure is there that rasgulla, but you can't eat it. Divine is his way of, you know, <laughs> dealing with us. So, but what we are, when there is peace, Atmarati, bliss, instead of that transient satisfactions, that is the sign of divine life. Who is leading the divine life? Then, to establish an infinite freedom in a world which presents itself as a group of mechanical necessities, Mechanical necessities, infinite freedom. What does it mean? Ultimate mechanical necessity is death and you can say, but death can wait. Even when you part or depart, you know that you don't die. There is that freedom. I am, therefore, whether I live or die, I am. That's what Sri writes in one of the places. That gives us that infinite freedom. It's not dependent on anything. To discover and realize the immortal life in a body subjected to death and constant mutation. This is the first thing. The body will be subject to death and mutation. Ultimately, there is physical immortality. That's Shubhinda himself says it's a couple of thousand years, it's the last result. We are always looking for the 
सबसे पहले वेर इज द फिजिकल इमोटल बॉडी यू शुड से भैया वेट यू वॉन्ट टू स्टेट अवे जम्प टू दज लाइक वेन पीपल वॉन्ट टू टेक ऑन द मोस्ट डिफिकल्ट प्रॉब्लम नो सी आउ श्री और श्री रामा एंड श्री कृष्णा शो दवे ही टैकल्स रावण एट दी एंड श्री कृष्णा टैकल्स कंस एट दी एंड Duryodhana at the end. There are many things to achieve, and that's what he is saying. Even when the body is subject to death and mutation, still to establish that state of immortality. This is offered to us as the manifestation of God in matter, and the goal of nature in a terrestrial evolution. To the ordinary material intellect. which takes its present organization of consciousness for the limit of its possibilities the direct contradiction of the unrealized ideals with the realized fact is a final argument against their validity what is this ordinary consciousness sir all these are very nice things i know it is written there but show me one specimen in pondicherry who is immortal by immortality they mean physical immortality immediately नहीं है ना सो इट इज ऑल ड्रीम्स दैट्स वाई यू सी इन सावित्री डेथ से इज प्रिसाइडली दीज थिंग्स बट एज आई सेट इज सच ए स्ट्रेंज कल्चर वी आर सो फॉर्चुनेट टू हैव बीन बॉर्न एंड ब्रॉट अप दैट वी डोंट हैव अनलेस अवर माइंड इज प्रियोक्यूपाइड विद इज मेटेरियल वी डोंट से रामा डाइड एवर हर्ड अबाउट इट आई मीन यू नो ही वॉक इन टू सर यू बट दैट डजेंट मीन दैट ही डाइड That's why Rama's manifestation, as I said in this story, recent manifestation, Swami Vivekananda, is a story told by him and documented. It cannot be. I mean, he continues to manifest in hearts which are open. Shri Krishna, we don't use the word "oh, he died long back." Though it may seem like that, yet it is not true. Our souls return from the pyre and the grave and take on the challenge. And then he says, "Well." Shobindu is see the perfect philosophy is that which takes everything into account. So he is not saying no, no. It is your thinking. It is not true. There is no contradiction. He doesn't say that. He says yes, there is a contradiction. And then he says something very beautiful. But if we take a more deliberate view of the world's workings, that direct opposition appears rather as part of nature's. profoundest method and the seal of her complete sanction the greater the challenge the greater the resistance the more beautiful the emergence is why because it increases the strength inside and when we look at creation and the typical example is he gives that example and we can stop for the break here that how did life emerge in matter it's so amazing if you look at that algae forming a film over the rock of course we know now it is algae but otherwise uh, it's living one didn't know that you know it's looks like kai we used to used to have a word in hindi it is formed it's something like we don't know slimy something did we know that that slime will one day grow into man no we are not slimy creatures but <laughs> slime is the origin and that's why these uh, algae and then their prototypes first cell organism protozoa they take a very special liking to human gut in the bowels you know, they uh, this is where we originated but we want to destroy them with all the metronidas all this that poor fellows tell them stay there don't come up and don't quote me to any doctor but <laughs> the thing is this is how life originated one single cell organism matter for life to burst out of matter it has taken how many billion years i don't remember now but 15 billion years the earth was formed cooled then maybe another 500 5 billion years 5 billion years it was just cooling and then one day life burst forth very difficult why to harmonize them because matter is inert we learn that matter does not move unless you push it by external force and life wants to move the sign of life is it must flow typically is air you put it anywhere it will flow expand 
Vayu Matarishwan, that is how it is called. It expands. It is the nature of life to expand and grow and move all the time. So, how can something very inert can suddenly bring out of itself something which is as active, self-reproducing as life? Well, nature does the miracle. Why it took so many years? Because that force of life which will come out as algae has to go, travel a far distance. So that's how. Same we see with the coming of mind. Somebody would have seen the ape. Even the best ape would not have imagined that God has this solution for me. It's not an idea whether monkey is better or man. That's not the issue. But no monkey, the best monkey could have never imagined based on the physical facts that man can emerge. And the same is true of us. That there are those who are very sane, wise people, well grounded as they say, who say all this is all fairy tale, supramental being, all this. But there are some who are a little bit insane and therefore a little more wise, who say in this creation, insanity, divine insanity, throwing atoms out of his hands, builds the galaxies. And that's how we see creation emerges. And what is the problem that we have to deal with? With that we will stop. For all problems of existence are essentially problems of harmony. They arise from the perception of an unsolved discord and the instinct of an undiscovered agreement or unity. This is a Mahavakya which applies to everything in life. The greater the discord, the greater the possibility of harmony and unity. Problem is we don't persist. Especially in the age of McDonald's culture, we just give up. Of course, in harmony, in a human relation, both have to persist. But see, even there at a most human level, I must say. If you ask anybody, even people who have separated, split, ask them after 30 years, after everything, don't you still love? And the answer will be, see, love never dies. Is it not true? It remains, it's the immortal element. But we have not given it enough chance to build harmony. And so in nature we see that wherever there is the greatest discord, there there is a possibility of greater harmony, like to end Arab, Palestine and um, Jews come conflict because they are brothers, Ukraine, Russia conflict, and of course, India and Pakistan conflict, it is going to end with ultimately with harmony. How? We can leave it to the divine wisdom. Okay, so we'll uh, stop for a 10 minutes break and then come back. <laughs>